sooner or later, every programmer has to deal with time zones. And I can't really offer much advice here. I can offer a cautionary tale. Um, I can tell you why you really should never, ever deal with time zones if you can help it. Let's imagine that someone has, has built an application that lets you calculate how many seconds something is in the past. You type in a date and a time, it gives you the number of seconds. And they, they look at that and think, okay, that, that kind of works for me, but let's, let's add a little box that lets you change the time zone. So if you're, you know, if you're comparing between now in New York and five days ago in London, you can work that out. And that's fine, you know, the, the little drop down lets you change which hour forward or backward of Greenwich you are. Brilliant. Sooner or later, after it gets a bit popular, they'll get a call from Australia. And Australia will say, G'day, mate. No, I'm not going to try and do accents. Um, Austra I just shouldn't do accents. Um, Australia will say, hello. Um, by the way, we're nine and a half hours ahead of Greenwich. And the programme will go, really? I'll say, yeah, yeah, nine and a half hours. So, oh, OK, I'll add a special case for you. That's fine. Then a little bit later, someone will call from Nepal. And they'll say, hello, um, we're five and a quarter hours ahead of Greenwich. And they'll say, really? I'll say, yeah, yeah, we've been that for ages. Yeah, five and a quarter hours. Great, okay. And they'll, and they'll put in a special case and maybe they'll look up the list of time zones, the, the canonical list that tells you what everything is. And they'll make sure that they've covered every time zone in the world. And then autumn will come along. And they'll get a call from England. And uh, England will say, excuse me, um, we're an hour out at the minute, what's going on? And they'll work out, hold on, the clock's just changed. That's fine, no, no, we dealt with that. We dealt with it, we, we made a note of when daylight saving changes for us, and we've put that in. And, and England will say, no, you see, daylight saving changes a week earlier for us. It's, it's different depending on where you live. We, we shift our clocks back a week before you do. And, and at that point, at that point, generally the program will start to hold their head in their hands and realize what they've got themselves into. And that's fine, you know, they'll, they'll put that in and they will deal with each country shifting to daylight savings time on a different day. And they'll look at the file that tells them how to do that and they'll copy all that in. And then they'll get a call from someone in the Southern Hemisphere again who'll say, yeah, well, we're not shifting back in the autumn, we shift forward. Our, our spring is in November. And, and at that point they'll generally start looking longingly at their intoxicant of choice and, and wondering whether they should have a quick drink before keeping going, and, and then they'll, they'll code that in as well. And then they'll get a call from Samoa, uh, out in the Pacific on the International Dateline, and Samoa will say, hello, um, yeah, we, we skipped a day the other year, and the programme will say, what? So, yeah, we skipped a day. We went from December the 29th, 2011, to December the 31st. We, we shifted from one side of the International Dateline from being hours and hours behind Greenwich to being hours and hours ahead of Greenwich. It helps us with trading with Australia. Can, can you take account of that when you work out how many days things are and how many seconds things are in the past? It's, it's fine, there's a, there's a file that tells you when any country has changed its time zone and it turns out that that happens fairly often. But they're, they're announced ahead of schedule, so as long as you keep that file updated and code that into your program's logic as well, it'll be fine. Then you look back and you notice that during World War II, England had double British summer time. It went completely onto BST and then just added an extra hour. So it was two hours ahead of Greenwich, despite having Greenwich. That's fine, you deal with that. It's changed. If you notice, I'm starting talking as if, as if it was you or me, because I've done this before and it's really, really frustrating. You make sure that you subscribe to the list of when countries are going to change their time zones, which happens, apparently, many times. Like, sometimes, several times in a year, because governments change over. And then, then the programmer, this, this mythical programmer, gets a call from Libya, who in 2013, with only a couple of days' notice, decided that they weren't going to put the clocks back. With enough notice that it wasn't possible for anyone to get the update out in time, and meaning that every Libyan computer, no matter what operating system it ran, was an hour out. But it's okay, you, you read the news article about that and you hurriedly code that in as well. And then, then you get a call from the West Bank, where the Israeli population is on a different time zone to the Palestinian population, because one is following Israel and one isn't. 
And now you have two populations of people in the same location who are following different time zones. And now they're all having to ask themselves whether they're on this time zone or, or this one, depending on who they are and where they are. And there's no way to code that into your program. And then, then you get a call from the historian who says, right, I'm trying to calculate some, some times back in the 18th century. And we changed from the Julian calendar to the, to the Gregorian calendar. And it's not that we lost about three weeks. It's just that we skipped right from this date to this date and, and missed the others. And can you code it so that, so that it just kind of works that out for me? And it's fine because someone else has already told you when those dates are and, and you can code that into your program's logic as well. But now it's looking really long and really complicated. It's a tangled mess of spaghetti code that somehow works out. And then you get a call from the Russian historian who says, yeah, we only changed the Gregorian calendar in the 20th century. And it turns out the dates that you skip change depend on, depending on your location. And, and can you deal with that as well? And then you get a call from the British historian who says that until, I think it was the 16th century, the year started on the 25th of March. Just to blow your mind there. On, on the 24th of March, 924, and then it will be the 25th of March, 925, and that is the next day, because you have gone from December 31st, 924, to January the 1st, 924, because it goes in that order and it's massively complicated. And then you get the call from the astrophysicist, who says, by the way, we just had a leap second. And at this point, you just kind of go, what? Leap seconds. Because the Earth does not rotate at a constant speed. It slows down, it speeds up as, as tectonic plates move about and, and magnetic fields shift or something like that. And so occasionally, the International Astronomical Union will work out whether we need a leap second. And if you do, the clocks go 23, 59, 58, and then it's 23, 59, 59, and then instead, instead of going like any sensible time zone would, it goes 23, 59, 60, and everything breaks because suddenly you have 61 seconds in a minute. So depending on your implementation, either your clock gets one second out of sync with the rest of the world, or it repeats a second. The way you're meant to deal with this is something called the Unix timestamp. A number file, I think, has talked about this before, that, that you have this number that started at the first exact second of 1970 and in increments, one second per second, constantly, tick, tick, tick. And that's great because what you're meant to do is you take whatever, whatever date has been given you and you calculate that as a Unix timestamp and you put that into your database. And, and that'll just deal with leap seconds, except it doesn't, of course it doesn't. Because, because you have universal coordinated time, which, which includes leap seconds, in that it repeats occasionally, and it just includes 23, 59, 60. And then you have astronomical time, which does not include leap seconds, and has steadily been getting out of sync with the rest of the world, because we need to look at the stars and design telescopes around it. And what you learn, what you learn after, after dealing with time zones, is that what you do is you put away your code. You don't try and write anything to deal with this. You look at the people who have been there before you. You look at the first people, the people who have dealt with this before, the people who have built the spaghetti code, and you go to them and you thank them very much for making it open source. And you give them credit, and you take what they have made, and you put it in your program, and you never ever look at it again. Because that way lies madness. Google actually has a really, really good approach to leap seconds that they invented themselves. There's an article about it on, on their blog, I think, that, that explains it. And they do something called a leap smear. Um, because having 61 seconds in a minute, or because having a clock tick back a second, uh, can be really, really bad for, for massive agencies that sort of have to synchronise everything really precisely and have to trust uh, that one bit of data was stored before another. They essentially smear the second out over the whole day. They increase their clock by a microsecond at a time, tick, 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 all the way through the day, so that it's sometimes maybe even half a second out 
from reality. But as long as everything on their servers is half a second out, it's built to be out of sync with the world um, as long as it knows that one thing happened before another. Like having continuity is more important than actually having accurate time.